Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 7, dealing with the Barry Morphew affidavit. In this episode, we're going to look at pages 66 and then the next seven pages dealing with his 10th interview that was conducted on February 28th, 2021. It's quite a lengthy interview compared to some of the others, and in it, he significantly changed his earlier accounts to match new evidence that had now been provided to him. And uh, one of the things that he did was he put a gun in his hand that afternoon when Suzanne was last known to be alive. What's also quite interesting is in this particular interview, Barry again asked for the lover's name. He also gave his code for knowing when people tell lies. And then he also discussed his activities on Saturday, May 9th. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So I think I previously told you that there were 13, Barry Morpheus given 13 uh, interviews or was interrogated 13 times. I did a recount just in order to see where we were in that timeline. This is the 10th interview while he gave another six after this. So in total there are 16 interviews, although one of them is kind of a brief exchange where he hands over a weapon. So technically maybe that doesn't count. Even so, 15 is a heck of a lot of separate occasions, separate versions to give to the police. Does that make sense? Now, one of the reasons why I'm doing this not in a live format is I really just want to focus on the affidavit and get through some of this because I really want to be done with Barry's versions uh, You know, when I go away. I kind of want to get through it and not leave you guys hanging. So I'm going to, going to be moving quite rapidly through the affidavit, not only in terms of lives. I'll be doing quite a few lives between the next sort of two weeks, um, but also, so this week and next week, but also where, where possible, I'll probably be doing certain episodes just to kind of speed up the process of going through the affidavit. So I hope you guys are happy with that. Okay, so without any further ado, uh, we are now going to go through the around about seven pages dealing with the February 28, 2021 interview, the 10th interview from Barry Morphia. And we're now going to go through it together. I'm going to actually show you the affidavit and we're going to go through it together on screen. So to reiterate, in this interview, Barry again asked for the lover's name, which is implying that he didn't know Jeff Libler's name, the man that Suzanne was having an affair with. He gave his code for knowing you know, how he could tell when people were telling lies and then again discussed his activities on May 9th. What's important here is that it is stressed that he significantly changed his early accounts to match evidence that's known as tailoring and something that is mentioned is that he actually mentions having a gun in his hand on the afternoon when Suzanne was last known to be alive. If you just think of this in a very basic way there's this uh, feeling from the authorities that she may have been maybe an intimate partner homicide and what we're now finding out from her partner is that he's saying oh during the exact time when Suzanne was last known to be alive, when she sort of disappeared, he was, he actually had a gun in his hand. So at 1.14 p.m., Special Agent Grissing greeted Barry and Barry replied, Hey guys, S.A. Grissing told Barry that agents needed to share information with him. Barry said, I got a meeting here in about 10 minutes. I was going to head for, but uh, how long will it take? So it's kind of like he's saying, I've got other things to do, right? And there is actually a image of Barry, and uh, this is in February, the end of February. It's sort of going into spring, I guess, early spring in Colorado. Agent Grissing told Barry that he had he has first right of refusal to the information. He said, "So Barry said, is this about her and the the guy?" Um, Special Agent Grissing said, "Agents would like to discuss the affair." the technology and other aspects, and that Barry can clear this up. After a few minutes, Barry asked, Are you able to give me the name of the gentleman? 
Special Agent Grissing said agents could share more information with Barry, then asked him what giving him the name of the man would do for him. Barry said, it's it's just peace of mind. So in other words, knowing who, who Suzanne had the affair with is going to give him peace of mind. If it was a friend or an acquaintance, just a peace of mind. Wouldn't you want to know if it was your wife? Special Agent Grissing said he did not know how he would respond. And one kind of does wonder if Barry did suspect an affair, wouldn't he have contacted Suzanne's family members and asked them what they knew, right? Wouldn't he have conducted kind of an investigation if he thought she was having an affair and she disappeared? Think about that. So anyway, Barry says, yeah, I mean, just to know that wasn't a friend at least. Special Agent Grusin confirmed the man was not Barry's friend. So going a bit further down, Special Agent Grusing responded, the evidence points towards her not being alive with the facts collected to date, not to determine who was guilty. Barry said, and, 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 and I'm not guilty. There's no doubt that I'm not guilty. I'm just telling you that from what Joe and Derek did to me, I mean, Jim Combe is a liar. And uh, I mean, do you think he's a liar? So it's quite interesting what he says here. It's dealing with evidence that Suzanne is not alive and uh, Barry if you think of those words he says there's no doubt that I'm not guilty it's a Grissing special agent Grissing said he did not know if Comey was a liar and Barry interrupted that's ridiculous how could you not know he's a liar from what he said on the stand in front of the Senate. Special Agent Grissing asked what he said. Barry said, well, I don't know exactly what he said word for word, but they asked him questions and he said, I don't recall, just like Hillary Clinton. All of them freaking liberals don't recall anything and when they don't uh, want to tell the truth. So it seems like Barry's saying, when you say I don't recall, it means you're not telling the truth. Of course, Barry has said, I don't recall on quite a few occasions himself. Um, I think it's quite a good point, but it's also interesting that Barry either has been studying up on this or has been listening to perhaps one true crime podcast too many. In any event, the footnote number 60 on the bottom of page 67, Barry equating, Barry's equating on people saying, I don't recall, means to him that those people are telling lies, was told back to Barry on April 22nd, 2021, when Barry said, I don't recall to most of the critical questions about what happened to Suzanne on Saturday and Sunday, May 9th and 10th. So in a weird way, Barry's own words have come back to haunt him or will come back to haunt him. And so obviously we will deal with that. Um, I think it's the final interview on the 22nd of April. He was arrested, I think, um, two weeks after that final interview. So we're trying to make our way towards that, but this interview is quite significant. This 10th interview where he lays it down and he says, when someone says they don't recall, they're lying. And then this is kind of thrown back at him um, around about, what is it, three months later, um, March, two months later, essentially. So Special Agent Grissing told Barry that agents bought, brought a notebook with evidence they would like to share with him. Barry said, could you answer me some questions first? Was she with him in New Orleans? So it's quite interesting. They come there with a notebook with evidence and he, he almost like delays them. He almost sort of uh, puts, them, puts that aside and says, no, don't show me the evidence. Can I ask you a few questions first? Anyway, he goes on to say, Special Agent Grissing says um, that she was in New Orleans. Barry says... And was she with him in Florida? Uh, Grissing said that she was. After pause, Barry said, and Indiana. Grissing said she was. So, so far, Barry's guessing all the right answers in terms of this. Barry asked, and how long has this been going on? Grissing said two years. Barry asked, two years? Special Agent Grissing said it started shortly after they moved to Colorado. Now, do you remember that it was Barry's idea to move to Colorado, but he said it was Suzanne's idea. One wonders whether 
Barry knew about the affair or suspected the affair right in the beginning. In other words, two years earlier, did Barry move Suzanne to Colorado to break up that affair? What do you guys think? Barry asked, and you can't tell me where they connected the first time. Special Agent Harris said they connected through social media, and Barry repeated social media. Barry said, and the app you said they were using to communicate, there's no way that I could have known about that. And what was that called again? It's quite interesting that he is so sure that he, he wouldn't have known about it. Barry said, uh, sorry, Special Agent Grissing said, agents did not want to give that to Barry, and he replied, I'm not going to hunt. Special Agent Grissing told Barry he was a hunter. It's quite interesting what he's saying. It seems to be that they don't want to tell him because he's a hunter and, you know, what would he do? Obviously, the answer is that the way they were communicating was using LinkedIn, it appears primarily and to some extent from uh, on WhatsApp. Barry said, I know, but I need this for my, I mean, I've, so, so who? I mean, just tell me who the guy is. So, yeah, once again, he's kind of stuttering. Now, bear in mind, Barry's this big, brave, brash, masculine guy, but sometimes he is very quiet and sometimes he seems to stutter. And he says, I don't know why you can't answer that. I'm not going to do anything to this guy. I, I can't afford to leave the only door, the only parent that my daughter has. If I go beat some guy up and go to jail, I, I can't afford that. Would I want to? Yeah. Would you? Yeah. Somebody screwing your wife for two years behind your back. That's just cold blooded. I would never do that to a guy. But I'm not going to do that. But for my, just for my peace of mind, I'd just like to know who it is. And do you believe me when I say I had no idea this was even happening? So that's just a really fascinating paragraph. He, he uses words like, I can't afford that, right? I can't afford to go to jail. He also says something about, um, you know, I'm not going to do anything to this guy. I'm not going to beat him up. And then he, he talks about it's just cold-blooded. And then he also talks about his peace of mind. Special Agent Grissing said some of the evidence items that the agents brought to show Barry would help prove he did not know. So it's, it's kind of interesting. The agents come in there saying, you know, this is going to help prove that you didn't know that your wife was having an affair. But it is interesting that Barry is almost more concerned in asking, you know, do you believe me when I say I had no idea this was even happening. Now, bear in mind, it's going on for two years. Anyway, Barry said, well, I didn't know. I'm telling you right now. I mean, she was the last person in the world I would suspect would do this. But for her to pull this off blows me away. Now, it's quite interesting, just those that choice of words, blows me away. Um, we go to footnote number 61 now and it refers to Barry has made at least 13 assertions by his third interview with the FBI, most of them unsolicited, that he had no idea about the affair and asked agents to say they believe him. So he's kind of asking the agents to say, tell me you believe me. This contradicts other statements made to the FBI and his actions in 2019 to find out who Suzanne is talking with and who she's seeing on her trips. So once again, Barry's almost portraying himself as a passive guy. Um, he's got no idea about the affair. Um, maybe Suzanne's not acting very well, drinking, whatever, but he's quite passive. Um, is Barry actually passive or is he more reactionary fellow? Is he kind of a hot-headed fellow? And so they, they, they do say that he, he makes 13 assertions, um, most of them unsolicited, that he's got no idea about this affair. So it's almost like he's protesting too much. He's protesting too much that he doesn't know about something. It's interesting here yeah, that they don't emphasize him talking about blows me away. Um, if you are blown away by somebody doing something and you're a hunter, could that imply or suggest, could one infer from that that you might want to blow them away? for doing something to you that you wouldn't have expected. You know, that she would be the last person you'd ex expect would do that. 
Anyway, Barry said, did she leave that night? Because I told Joe and Derek that we had sex and went to bed and I went to sleep. And I worked so hard that when I go to sleep, I'm out until three o'clock. Special Agent Grissing asked about the hike to Fuse's Lake, if that happened. Barry said, well, I was confused on the hike too. I thought it was that Saturday, but after talking to Joe and them, it could have been Friday. It could have been Thursday. So here is a contradiction here. Remember I said previously that he can't even remember the last moment that he saw Suzanne, can't remember the last thing that was said between them, and now he can't even remember the last day that he spent with her. Now he can't remember. You might say, well, it's February, he can't remember. But the previous statements he made were much earlier. I think it was June or July, just a month or two after she disappeared. You can't really say that he misremembered then. Anyway, so now he says, I remember us doing that, and I thought it was Saturday. Special Agent Grissing asked Barry if he came home Saturday and went for the hike or bike ride. Barry said, when I came home, we did lunch then. Special Agent Grissing asked if that was veggie soup, and Barry replied, yeah, yeah, lunch. Special Agent Grissing asked if they hiked after lunch. Barry said, I don't recall because I don't even recall taking my bobcat back to crib. How's that? For he's just spoken about I don't recall. Now he said I don't recall twice. Special Agent Harris confirmed Barry texted crib that he was at the house and needed a few minutes. Barry said, oh, okay, yeah, and I don't, I don't know why. I've, I've got a great memory. I don't know why I don't recall that. Again, I don't recall. Special Agent Grissing said Barry called Tim Backho and Barry said Backho attachment for the Bobcat and I looked at that and I don't know if it was that day or what. Special Agent Grissing told Barry he drove to where the Backho attachment was and Barry interjected, looked at it. Barry said, well, I didn't like it. I looked at it and didn't like it. Yeah, I called him and told him I wasn't interested. Barry eventually said he wasn't interested because of the price. Now we go to footnote 62. It says, reference earlier interview with Tim, uh, what is that, Kilko. Barry already knew the price of the backhoe attachment and never told Kilko why he did not want to buy it after that Saturday, May 9th. It's quite interesting. Special Agent Grissing explained that Suzanne took her last proof-of-life picture while Barry was out on his errand, but it was not apparent where she was. Barry said, oh, she had to be at the house because Special Agent Grissing said Suzanne's, re Suzanne's location at the house was unclear and asked Barry if he would look at the picture. So what, what the agent's trying to do is be quite clear when and where this picture was taken. Barry says, yeah, and like I said, I'm running really late. I don't have an hour, but let me look at this. So he's kind of making an excuse dealing with this last image of his wife. He's kind of saying, I've got to go to a meeting, but okay, let me look quickly at, at this evidence. He says, and I would really like for you guys, since I'm being cooperative, trying to help you, that you would give me the name of this guy. That's, I mean, that's all I want for peace of mind. So again, it's almost like tit for tat. He's saying, I'll look at this photo, but what you need to tell me who, what the name is of this guy, right? Special Agent Grissing told Barry he had not been cleared yet in Suzanne's homicide, citing the evidence in the affair and other collected evidence, and that some of the evidence is contrary to his statements. In other words, he's saying that Barry hasn't been cleared yet in Suzanne's homicide. Barry said, yeah, but it can't contradict my statements. There's just no way. I told Joe word for word, place for place, everywhere I was. And this is kind of going to alibi. Does he have an alibi? Special Agent Grissing asked Barry about his first statement of setting his alarm for 4.30 in the morning. This has now come up, I think, the third time. Barry said, I, I, I don't remember setting the alarm. I might have told him that. So once again, he's stuttering on this pretty important aspect. Special Agent Grissing confirmed he told him that. Barry said, but, but not my phone alarm, the, the clock alarm. 
But, I, you know, I said that thing so many times. I mean, maybe I didn't remember, but I know I wanted to get going early. And sometimes when I know I got to get up early, I set the alarm. So it seems like Barry's now saying, oh, I didn't set my phone alarm, I set the clock alarm. So a little bit of a tailoring there of his original version. Special Agent Grissing told Barry the FBI knew he was moving well before 4.30. So this is quite a shocking revelation. They're saying, you know, you may have set your alarm for 4.30, you may have woken up at 4.30, but guess what? We actually know that you were moving around before 4.30. This must come as quite a big shock to Barry. Barry said, I get up, I got uh, an, I, I got an enlarged prostate. I get up and pee and all night through, all through the night. Now, you may, Barry, you, you may remember that Barry had just said earlier that he works very hard and when he goes to sleep, he sleeps all the time. Now he's saying he gets up all the time in the middle of the night. He also said he's like got a very good memory for what he says. Well, it doesn't appear to be that way, does it? So, uh, we go on to the next page now. I think it's page 70. Special Agent Grissing interrupted and told Barry he was outside in his driveway. Um, so I think what this means is he interrupts Barry, telling Barry where he was. Instead of, you know, he wasn't like going to the bathroom. He wasn't in the restroom. He wasn't taking a leak or something. He was actually outside in his driveway very early in the morning. Barry says, well, if I did anything, anything outside, it wasn't anything wrong. So now he's saying, you know what, even if I was outside, I wasn't doing anything wrong. Special Agent Grissing explained Barry's statements do not matter compared to the importance of him seeing the evidence. Barry replied, it doesn't matter. Your evidence does not matter because it, it's, if, if it's anything to do with tying me up with her disappearance, it's wrong. So it's quite interesting. Barry doesn't seem to want to see the evidence. Special Agent Grissing said the agents are in the in an auditor role, not determiners of guilt. Barry interrupted, but Johnny, you know that there's nothing on my phone that shows that I knew about her affair. So I know, I think I know what you guys are trying to do. You're trying to say, if I knew about that, then I did something. So once again, he's being very adamant that there's nothing on his phone that shows that he knew about the affair. Um, he's trying to, he's being very adamant to say there's no proof that he knew about her affair. Special Agent Grissing later told Barry that Suzanne told Jean Ritter not to come over to have coffee that week. That's the neighbor. That's also the person who called 911. That's also the person who confirmed to Barry at Barry's prompting that the bicycle wasn't in the garage. Barry said, see, this is all pointing to her leaving. All of it is. And if she's in Mexico somewhere and she's freaked out or something went wrong, how do we know that? So now he's saying he thinks she's in Mexico. Barry said he had to go to work but agreed to see the photo of Suzanne's last proof of life. It's quite interesting that they've been speaking all this time and he still hasn't showed, well, he still hasn't asked to actually see the photo. You'd think that he'd want to see it. But now it's like he almost seems to want to avoid seeing the photo. And so this is the photo that is shown to him. It's a photo of his wife, I think, in a bikini, smiling, um, apparently lying down, possibly on the deck, but one can't see the background. Barry looked at the photo and said, well, look at her. She's obviously drunk. Look at her eyes. Do you know what drunk eyes look like? He, he added, I mean, would you say those eyes are drunk eyes? Special Agent Grissing said bloodshot eyes are what he looks for. Barry said, no, it's, 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 the la it's the lazy eyes is what I see in her, and she drank. And so you get this pretty weird impression of him here where Barry is kind of quite merciless. You know, he doesn't really say anything nice about her. Um, he's, earlier he was calling someone else a liar and so on. Barry seems to be someone who can be quite nasty. And so, you know, he hasn't seen his wife for a very long time. And he, he doesn't look at the photo and become emotional in a remorseful way, in a grief-stricken way, 
in a sad way, he seems to actually become angry and judgmental and accusatory. He says, well, look at her. She's obviously drunk. Look at her eyes, right? It seems kind of merciless. It seems kind of that he set himself up as judge, jury, and, you know, um, executioner kind of thing. So Special Agent Grusing asked Barry if she was wearing that swimsuit when he came home, and he said uh, she was laying out. When Special Agent Grusing confirmed, Barry said, yep, yep. So here you have Barry confirming that when he arrived home, he did find Suzanne laying out. Right? And so the question is, did Barry interrupt or intercept or interject some kind of communication between Suzanne and Jeff? And did that lead to something? Now we go to page 71 of 129. Special Agent Grusing asked if this arrival at home was made after the blade change with Krabari. Barry replied, no, that's from going home after I got finished with Morgan for lunch. She was laying out and then we ate lunch. Special Agent Grusing said the photo was taken later that day and he replied, then she must have went back out when, when I left. Special Agent Grusing asked Barry if Suzanne was still laying out the second time he came back. Barry shook his head and said, I don't recall that. After a pause, he, says, he said, I don't recall. Now things kind of go up a gear as the agent sort of continues to reveal what he knows. Are you sure you want to hear this? Special Agent Grusing told Barry that when he arrived that afternoon, meaning when Barry arrived on the afternoon Saturday, May 9th, his phone went around the house, quote, quite a bit. What do you think that means? It means that Barry arrives home on that Saturday afternoon and suddenly Barry's phone is kind of zigzagging around the house quite erratically, quite a lot, right? If Barry's phone is moving rapidly, erratically, quite a bit, what do you think Barry is doing? Barry was nodding his head and saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Special Agent Grusing asked, were you looking for her? Barry said, I shoot, I shoot chipmunks. And that is quite a huge, if you want to call it a Freudian slip or just, um, you know, jumping the gun to kind of say, uh, why were you kind of running around quite a bit? Now, bear in mind, he previously said they'd gone hiking Saturday afternoon, they'd gone kind of in the woods hiking. Now he is sort of volunteering right in terms of that critical aspect. He's saying when he arrives home, he just quickly went and he shot chipmunks. Special Agent Grusing seems to sort of do a double take and he says, you shoot chipmunks. Barry says, yeah. Special Agent Grusing said, it looked like he was chasing one. Barry said, yeah, I was. I've shot 85 chipmunks because they got into my furnace and cost me a bunch of money. So when I'm home, now this is also quite interesting. In the middle of talking about him arriving home, he immediately... Because uh, no, he's now been found out that he was where he was moving, how he was moving. He's now acknowledged that he was using a gun. He's also acknowledged that when he shoots chipmunks, um, they or he shoots chipmunks because they get into his furnace. And so what that's almost implying is that there would be um, tissues or some kind of DNA or residues and hair possibly even as well, in the furnace. That's all acknowledged just in that small revelation that, by the way, we know how you were moving that Saturday afternoon, right? So he says that he was chasing a chipmunk in the same time that his wife was actually actively engaging with Jeff Libler. He wasn't chasing... Um, Suzanne, right? He wasn't chasing Suzanne. He was chasing a chipmunk. He had a gun in his hand. He wasn't. He had no kind of intentions to harm her. He wanted to harm a chipmunk, right? Um, Special Agent Grusing interrupted and asked if he had used a .22, and Barry replied, 22. 
So when I'm home, I just walk around and shoot him. Just keep going around the house. Barry made circular motions with his right arm. He said, every time I go around the house, I'll see another and I'll shoot it. Special Agent Grissing told Barry that activity would explain his phone's uh, behavior. Adding that he left his driver door open in the garage before he went to the first patio. Barry said, hmm, and said, yeah, shooting while, yeah, shooting. While nodding his head during the description of the movement, he added, no, I'm shooting chipmunks. I've done that ever since we're, we've moved in. Special Agent Grissing asked Barry if he remembered doing it that day. He nodded his head and said, hmm, oh yeah. That's the that's that's brought us to the bottom of page seventy one. Now bear in mind, Barry is absolutely certain he's got this incredible conviction that he knows exactly what he did when he arrived that day. He shot chipmunks, right? But now he can't remember if he went hiking, and he can't remember you know some other details regarding you know what is going on, right? So don't you find that a little bit odd? He can remember exactly the fact that he got out of his car and started shooting chipmunks. Anyway, Special Agent Grissing asked Barry what happened next. He shook his head and said, I don't recall. Well, there's those words again. Uh, Special Agent Grissing... Well, why am I jumping around here? Special Agent Grissing asked about the hike happening then. Barry said, it could have been very... I know there was one in the two or three day period where we went to Fooses, but I don't know. I can't tell you exactly when it was and I don't recall it. Again, <laughs> Special Agent Grissing showed Barry a photo sent by Suzanne to Libla in the morning of May 9, 2020, with a series of texts discussing Barry's desire to move to Arizona. Special Agent Grissing asked if that was a uh, closet. Barry said, yep. And the text discussed pizza from the night before, and Barry said, yeah. What's quite interesting here is the agent is showing texts sent to Libla, and Barry doesn't seem particularly surprised. There's no mention of him being surprised, him sort of grabbing the, the uh, evidence and sort of going through it, and it doesn't seem surprised. He is quite reticent in his responses. Then it says... When the text, he's still wanting Arizona, was read, Barry said, who's he? Me. Special Agent Grissom confirmed. Barry asked, why is she talking to this guy about me and my life? Special Agent Grissom reminded Barry of him asking agents about Suzanne being in Arizona, if he was suspicious about Suzanne's guy being in Arizona at that point. Barry asked, is this guy from Arizona? Special Agent Grissom answered he was not. Barry asked, can you tell me what state he's from? Special Agent Grissing said he was from Barry's home state, and Barry repeated, Indiana, from my hometown. Special Agent Grissing said he could not tell Barry that. Special Agent Harris said if anything happened to the guy, agents would be placing Barry in a bad place. Barry interrupted. I understand that. I understand. And nobody knows but you guys, not Chaffee, CBI. And so Barry's like quite concerned, you know, so only you guys know about this. Remember he previously said, please don't, let, you know, the most important thing in his life is, you know, don't let anyone know that Suzanne had an affair, right? Anyway, Barry was shown a picture of the locations around the Morphew house of Suzanne's phone activity at 4.10 a.m. and 4.15 a.m. on May 10th. And this is Suzanne's phone activity, not Barry's, right? So Suzanne was up apparently very, very early, and not only that. Remember, Barry said he woke up at 4.30 and she was still asleep. Well, this shows that she was not asleep, or certainly her phone wasn't asleep. Her phone was moving around. He said, well, if she did that, I have no idea that it went anywhere but, but the house. But if you was to ask me, I'd say it was at the house the whole time, meaning the phone was at the house the whole time. Special Agent Grissing told Barry that agents wanted to complete this with him this evening. He asked, is it going to be done? 
uh, when told it would be done, Barry asked, done, done? I think what he means is, is it going to be over? Are we going to be finished with this? Special Agent Grissing told Barry if he sat down with agents and went through the binder, agents would be done talking to him. Barry asked, but what if I tell you something wrong that was, de- well, something he says is unintelligible, different with Joe and Derek? So now he's kind of quite concerned. He says, what if I say something wrong? What if I say something that contradicts what I said earlier? Special Agent Grissing and Special Agent Harris explained that Barry was helpful today and that the other interviews would be the same. He said, I mean, these things are, are just, they're, they're not even relevant. I just, of course, they are very relevant. Special Agent Grissing said, the agents have a lot of data and Barry is the one who knows. He said, all right, I'll call you when I get finished. And he walked away. And that brings us to the bottom of page 72 of page uh, of, of 129. And that then brings us to the February 29th interview, which is quite short. And then there's another one, March 1st, which is um, also fairly short. Shall we go through these two more just to get through this? So on February 29th, 2021, while Special Agent Grissing and Special Agent Harris were parked about one block away from Gary's condo, Barry drove his truck beside the agent's car at about 5.03 p.m. and handed a weathered .22 caliber altered rifle with a newly mounted rifle scope to agents. Barry said that was the gun he used to shoot the chipmunk and he had to leave to work out at the gym. So he's sort of on his way out, hands over the gun and drives off. I'm not going to have a long talk with you. Here's the gun, now go away kind of thing. And so that was that. Now we go to March 9th, 2021. So all, all three of these interviews took place over the course of three days. February 28, February 29, a brief encounter, and then March 1, a kind of a bit more of an extended interview. On March 1, 2021, in this interview, Barry again significantly altered his prior statements to adjust to evidence presented to him. Now, in true crime, we know that, you know, it should be quite simple. You should be able to give a single statement, and that statement should be fairly consistent. If there are small little inconsistencies that play out on things that aren't significant, such as something that is significant is what time did you wake up? When did you last see somebody? What did you do at the sort of time critical time that a person was last seen? If those are the particular things that keep changing, well, then then there are serious problems because it looks like you are trying to fit your narrative, adapt your narrative until it is going to fit in what somebody knows you were actually doing. So Barry said that he turned left on Highway 50 as he left the house on May 10. So Barry seems to have cottoned on to the fact that they are able to track his movements using his phone and so almost, is it 10 months later, for the first time in 10 months, now he's saying, oh, I didn't actually go straight to Broomfield, I actually turned left first. And, oh, I did that because I went to see where Elk were going. And that put him in the direction of Suzanne's helmet. And so they specifically saying here, the way that he drove meant that he was in the area of where Suzanne's helmet was found in terms of beside the road. The admission to Special Agent Harris was for the was the first time Barry admitted to turning left on Highway 50 away from the Broomfield route. Okay, well, there they say it. This accounts for the missing mileage from his return to trip home from, I think it's return trip home from the Broomfield Hotel. Barry's odometer meter registered a 183-mile trip to the hotel that morning, including about two miles of deviations, and a 167-mile trip on the same route home. So uh, there's 14 extra miles that are, that are unaccounted for. So you can see just how detailed the investigation is in terms of the investigators. You can see to what extent they've done their homework. And Barry's now kind of in some trouble 
why is there this discrepancy, Barry? Oh, well, now Barry will provide some more information. Okay, but why didn't you provide this information to begin with? Why do we have to find out where you actually were and then you say, oh, yes, I was there? Why don't you volunteer that information? And once again, it's in a critical aspect. It is where Suzanne's helmet has been found. Special Agent Harris explained to Barry that sometimes questions shed light on things and helps investigators know where not to look for Suzanne as well. Special Agent Harris states there are things about his truck we are wondering and Asked Barry, when he left for Broomfield, did he turn right or left onto Highway 50? That brings us to page 74 of 129. Barry said, yeah, there was a herd of elk in the road and there's one bull and it was a nice bull. And they all went up the gully there where, the, where that old washed out road is. And they went up there. And I'm like, oh, I want to see how big this bull is. And I turned down there and... And they crossed right in front of me, and then I went down to the Garfield turn, uh, turn around, and then went to Broomsfield. Special Agent Grusing asked what Garfield is. Barry said, it's a little town before the ski town, little ski town. Special Agent Grusing asked if it was before Monarch. Barry said, yeah, I turned around right there. Special Agent Grusing explained that agents have checked and hadn't seen Barry or others go past the Monarch camera. So, yeah, once again, they've got certain information. They're asking Barry questions, and Barry's make, giving answers that don't line up with what they know. Barry said, yeah, I didn't. I turned around there. I turned, I, I went that way because I saw those elk. They were in the road right there before I got up to 50. And I let him cross, and then there was one good bull in there, and I... I like, man, and I just miss seeing how good he was. Yeah, no, I'm a hunter, and I just wanted to see him, and I just turned that way to look at him. That's, yeah, that's that's the only thing. And when I went to Broomsfield, I told Joe and Derek um, everywhere I stopped. I had crap blowing out of the truck. I pulled over at one spot, got my truck situated, went off. Barry seems to be... Uh, being very defensive and giving lots of explanations. And so in the affidavit, there is a map where they show the residence, they show the bike, they show the road to Denver and, by implication, uh, Broomfield. Barry refers to it as Broomsfield. And so you can see he first drove away from Denver and I guess by implication away from Broomfield, um, in the direction of where the bike was found, in the direction where the helmet was found, and then apparently he made a U-turn and came back the same direction. He never made it past Garfield. It says Barry's trip to Garfield adds approximately five miles each way to his morning trip and places Barry and his vehicle in the direction the, the helmet was discarded west from the bicycle. And so one does have to ask, did the bicycle and the helmet get to its their various locations because somebody rode the bike there or because somebody put the bike in the truck and rode the bike there? Because somebody put the helmet in the truck and drove the helmet there. Also, what's very evident is both the bike and the helmet are found right beside the, the road. And that brings us to a very long interview I think it was um, four days later, was this one on March the 1st? Four days later on March 5th, 2021. And we're not going to deal with it just now. I'll deal with that in the next live. The uh, the very long March 5th, and then I think there was a second part to it. Yeah, March 5th, it's, quite, it's really a long interview. We'll deal with that in the next live stream. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.